All right, this morning on Resurrection Sunday 2023, we're going to make our way to John chapter 11. If you want to go there with the Bible that you brought or one in the seat back in front of you, or if you want to go there on your idol phone or your Satan song. Just a little housekeeping this morning on Resurrection uh, Sunday. As soon as the message is over and the last song concludes, we're going to make our way, for those who can stay for five minutes, out to the baptismal beach, and we have a baptism after uh, service, so that's pretty awesome. So we're going to focus on two verses this morning in John 11, but I want to read uh, starting in verse 1. And so if you want to join me in the first verse of John chapter 11, it says, Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, and the town of Bethany was the town of Mary and her sister Martha. And this uh, was the same Mary, he points out, who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair. And her brother Lazarus was sick, and therefore the sisters sent to Jesus, who was some way off, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he told those who were around him, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now down to verse 17. So when Jesus came, that is to Bethany, some days later he found that he, that's Lazarus, had already been in the tomb for four days. Verse 20, now Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. And so Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And here's the two verses we will focus on. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She responded, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who's come into the world. Now, verse 38, then Jesus came to the tomb, and he was groaning in himself. And there was a cave, and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, Take away the stone. Verse 41, then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes, and he said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now when he had said these things, he cried out with a a very loud voice, Lazarus, abracadaver. (laughs) You get it? He was dead. He's not abracadaver. Never mind. No, I mean, biblically, it would be Jesus come, come forth is what he said to Lazarus. Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with the cloth. And Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. Now, from this time, some scholars say as short as three weeks later, Jesus will give himself to the authorities to be crucified on the cross and buried in a tomb. And on the third day, he'll rise again. And when he rises, his disciples will find his grave clothes lying on the slab where he had been laying. And yet they'll then find a napkin or the face wrapping actually folded up and put where his head would have been. And he will have fulfilled what he spoke in verses 25 and 26 here. I am the resurrection and the life. What I want to do today on this Resurrection Sunday is have you keep your finger there in your Bible. 
And I want to just briefly talk about what resurrection is and then what it's not before I come back and we just take apart these two verses for a short period of time. And so as we do that, let me begin by uh, defining resurrection for you. Uh, resurrection is the state of having passed through death and then having risen again to never die, to eternal life. So that is, in short, exactly what resurrection is. Through death, raised again, to eternal life. And so with that as our backdrop, let's then jump into what resurrection is not for a few minutes. According to our story and in line with it, resurrection is not revivification. The story of Lazarus is a story of revivification. This is where someone dies and then comes back to life only to die again. And the reality is that every story in the Bible outside of Jesus Christ's resurrection is not a resurrection. It's a revivification. And so these are in some ways robbed, like Lazarus, of paradise in his spot and taken back to life only yet to die again. So resurrection is not this. Uh, more attuned to our culture and one of the common fallacies about death and the afterlife, uh, resurrection is not reincarnation. Reincarnation is a Hindu idea, uh, whereas the belief is that the human soul migrates from one body form to the next, being purified through these successive lives until the soul finally becomes divine. And this is uh, karma, right? Karma says distinctly, uh, I get what I deserve. Uh, I get paid back for how I lived, good or bad. And see, karma is uh, completely against the idea of Christianity because Christianity says in Christ Jesus, I don't get what I deserve, which is hell and death. I get, by God's grace and mercy, heaven as I believe in Jesus Christ and forgiveness. And by the way, uh, from Hinduism, Eastern mysticism, and then kind of Native American ideas as well, uh, we have the idea of spirit animals. You know, we would come back as animals. And I'll tell you, uh, it's not a biblical concept. But somebody once told me, like, Mike, you're my spirit animal. I had no clue what that meant. But I'll tell you what, if I ever do come back as a spirit animal, I want to be like a puma or something awesome. Like big cat country at the zoo, just prowling around. You know, but, but truthfully, there's no... Uh, biblical basis for this, nor similarly, uh, and I hate to say this because some of you so uh, really do believe in this, we do not come back as angels. Your loved one does not pass and become your angel. Your loved one's not hovering over you with, with wings. It sounds great. It's just not biblical. Neither do we become ghosts or these disembodied spirits that just roam the earth. There's no uh, biblical basis uh, for any of this, but it's interwoven in our culture with much of people's understanding of resurrection and reincarnation. Now, when you think about uh, narrowing it down to more like uh, Christian, and I'll use that word loosely, um, denominations, resurrection is not universalism. And there's not a ton of universalists left anymore, but universalism teaches that Eventually, everybody goes to heaven, and this is a fantastic teaching. I mean, I like the idea that everybody goes to heaven. Uh, it's just not biblical. And so it teaches no matter what you do, in the end, you'll end up in heaven. And the idea was perpetuated by Origen of Alexander in the third century. Uh, it's kind of funny. It's Origen was Origen. But Origen, you know, he, he had some things right, and then lots of people see him as a complete heretic, and he definitely got this one wrong. And, and by the way, when we think about some of the other ideas that are coming up, there is no holding place after death that we can be prayed into heaven from by people still on this side. 
So none of that is biblical. And yet people deal with uh, the afterlife in so many different ways. Some different groups that we interact with daily say uh, Jehovah's Witness have different ideas. So resurrection is not annihilationism. This is a Jehovah Witness idea that says um, those who die apart from Christ simply cease to exist. Um, and so it's, it's, as I have for you here, unbelievers won't experience uh, eternal punishment in a literal hell like the Bible teaches, but will simply vanish or they'll have their souls extinguished. Um, so that's the worst there is for an unbeliever. And then along those lines, uh, resurrection is not soul sleep. And the basic idea behind soul sleep is that when a person dies, they don't go immediately to heaven to be with God. Their enter uh, their souls, their enters their souls into this kind of um, unconscious limbo, you might say. So uh, they're not alive, but they're not in heaven. They're not conscious of being dead, but they've ceased to exist. And so they are, uh, and hence the term soul sleep. So uh, this is more like a Seventh-day Adventist idea. And yet uh, they come from that spot because uh, sleep is a biblical metaphor for death. In Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, I have there for you, it says, And, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So sleep is a biblical metaphor for death. And it works like this. Um, the body, when we die, is planted or buried. And for the unbeliever, they go to a place that is not actually literally hell. No one that I can tell biblically, there's not one person in hell yet. It's a place of torment. Sometimes it's Hades, sometimes it's Sheol, there are other names, but proper hell isn't experienced until the final judgment when Satan, his henchmen, and unbelievers are cast into a worse place than they are tormented now, uh, the lake of fire, all right? But they are uh, nevertheless there, unbelievers, in this place, their soul and spirit, uh, while their body, as you, you know, have interacted with the term sleeps. Now, for the believer, the body sleeps, but the soul and spirit go to be with Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8 says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, which leads people to say, well, okay, if our body is in the ground and our soul and spirit are with Jesus, like, how does this work? Jesus is there in body form, we know. His body, his soul, his spirit have all been reunited in glorification. So many scholars believe, I kind of hold to this, that between death and resurrection, there is an intermediary state that probably includes a temporary celestial or heavenly body until we get uh, the one that was buried glorified. So here's the deal. Resurrection is reunification. And uh, resurrection is the reunification of the sleeping body with the soul and the spirit to eternal life or to eternal death. And the believer's body and soul and spirit have been redeemed, as we know. So resurrection is the permanently transformed body being glorified. And the result is that that body then is 100% compatible with God. And by compatible, I mean able to experience God without barriers, and that's what heaven really is. To experience his glory, his goodness, his plan, his beauty, his uh, holiness, uh, his all, all in one uh, place without any barriers for eternity. And the body must be resurrected uh, for that to be the case. Because God made us body, soul, and spirit. And this body then will be resurrected to join our souls and spirits in heaven. And this is what 1 Corinthians teaches us. And by the way, if you want the full discourse theologically on resurrection, it's 1 Corinthians 15. 
And twice over the 18 years our church has existed, I have taught the whole chapter of 1 Corinthians 15 because it is the finished work on resurrection. But I decided since I've done it twice, I would spare you the 58 verses this morning. Now that said, that's the place to go in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 42 through 44 says that concerning the resurrection of the dead, the body is sown in corruption. Uh, it's touched by sin. It's corrupting. It's then uh, raised to incorruption. It's sown in dishonor. It's raised to glory. It's sown in weakness. It's raised in power. It's sown as a natural body. And this is also uh, called uh, terrestrial. And it's raised in a spiritual body, which is uh, celestial. It's still a body, but it's got different characteristics. The way Jesus, after his resurrection, could go apparently through walls, and he wasn't bound by the, the laws of this uh, universe. And there's a natural body, and he says again, there's a spiritual body. Now, when it comes to the resurrection, the way I understand it, there are five resurrections in the Bible. You might take a snapshot of this because you won't remember it all. There are people who debate this, but this is the way I see it. It seems pretty clear to me biblically. That, number one, the first resurrection is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. To this point in history, remember, there has never been another true resurrection. Just revivifications. And so Jesus Christ is the first fruits, is what we're told in Corinthians, of the resurrection. And because he lived a sinless life, and because he died taking the penalty of sin for us upon himself, he then raised again on the third day, broke the chains of sin and death, and therefore any who believe in him can also have resurrection and life. Now, secondly, we wait as a church age for what I believe is a biblical concept of the rapture, to be taken out of this world, some generation, immediately, uh, called up as the trumpet is blown. And then when we are taken up as church age saints, uh, we stand before the Bema Seat of Christ, which is a, a judgment where we don't get told, depart from me if we did bad. We're told, okay, you did this thing and this thing and this thing and this thing. And our, our works, the things we do in heaven uh, for, for God on this earth are piled up in heaven. And some of it is burned up as wood and hay and stubble. Other of it's refined as gold and, and silver. And, uh, and so really that judgment is uh, what we are rewarded for as we follow the Lord faithfully in this life, and we then have the capacity given to us to experience heaven. The more faithful, it seems, the more capacity to experience heaven. Uh, the less faithful, maybe the less capacity to experience heaven, but it's still heaven. Now, when the church is taken away, salt and lights out of the world, the tribulation happens seven years of hell on earth, and at the end of that tribulation, you have the third resurrection, which is uh, the tribulation saints. So if you think it's, it's hard now to live as a Christian, here's how we display our Christianity in the church age. We're going to do it right after this, uh, this lesson. We're going to go out and be baptized. But in the tribulation, the way you display your Christianity is off with your head. It's death. It's choose life or death for Jesus. I'm really thankful I live in baptismal age. You know? Now, at the same time, as Jesus is going to come back physically at the end of the tribulation, there is going to be, uh, there's going to be a resurrection not only of those tribulation saints, but also the Old Testament saints that have been their bodies sleeping. And Jesus institutes a thousand-year reign where uh, these saints, uh, the church age, the tribulation saints, the... Old Testament saints all, oddly enough, get to be on this earth in celestial bodies with people in terrestrial bodies. This weird thousand years of God ruling and reigning. And then at the end of that, Satan cast in with all unbelievers to the lake of fire and chained up forever. And then a new heaven and a new earth. And at that time, there is a resurrection of the wicked. And for those not found in the Lamb's book of life, they'll only hear, depart from me, I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. Five resurrections. Now, I say all that to say, resurrection involves uh, judgment to eternal death or eternal life. 
and the Greco-Roman world and the Near Eastern world, which we would consider uh, the Middle East, uh, the Near Orient. Uh, they, neither one, the Romans, the Greeks, or you know, the, the Eastern religions that dominated the area of what was known at the time, Palestine or Israel, um, none of them believed in a biblical resurrection. And if you ask yourself why, I could probably give you a lot of answers. In fact, I could bore you with all my ideas, but I think it, it can be summed up in this. Resurrection involves accountability to God. And so if you don't want accountability to God, you're definitely going to write that out of your theology. And yet the Bible tells us in, in Romans chapter 14, verse 12, that we all give an account of the deeds done in what? This body, this one right here. This is the body I'm living this life out for Christ in right here. And I will give an account in this body. Now that said, Jesus is the resurrection. If you want to go back to your verses, we're going to just cruise through these two verses real quickly. He says, I am the resurrection. I am is uh, past, it's present, it's future. I am. And we've talked about what's wrapped up in that name, but I am the resurrection. The resurrection is right now. I am the resurrection. He didn't claim to have the resurrection. He claimed to be the resurrection. And so to know Jesus is to have the resurrection and notice I am the resurrection and the life. Please note that the life, not a life. There is no true life without Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Not just Savior, but also Lord. And what happens is when you give your life to Christ, your guaranteed resurrection, not just in the future, but he begins, begins to resurrect all the years the locust have eaten. He begins to change things. He begins to transform you. And then what happens is you begin to seek his will and you find his purpose for your life, not your own, his. You begin to find uh, meaning and worth and peace and joy, abundant life. This is what he promises. And so he is right now the resurrection and the life. And then he goes on to say that he who believes in, in me or Jesus, though he may die, he shall live. And Jesus presents himself as the champion over death. When you think about champions, um, you think about the story of David and Goliath, right? These are two champions that instead of, of all the armies killing each other in mass, they send out two champions. And Goliath fights for the Philistines and David fights for the Israelites. If Goliath wins, his army wins without further bloodshed, and they are the champion. If David wins, the Israelites win, and their army wins without further bloodshed. It was, it was thought to be a civil warfare, if there is such a thing. And so Jesus, uh, through the pen of Paul, says this, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, again, verse 21, For since death came through a man, that's Adam, the resurrection of God comes through a man. And so Adam was perfect. God ran him out, if you will, as our champion against Satan, and Adam failed. And he passed down to each of us sin, which is called federal headship. And so the only way that sin entered into mankind and humanity by a man could be dealt with is through a man. And so our champion having failed, God ran out his son. Not just a man, the man, a man, one man, the man, the God man, Jesus Christ. And he whoops him Satan hiney. That's the reality of it. And so as that is the case, he who believes in Jesus, though he may go through the process of death, he shall live. And again, that's life now, but that's also life later. Please understand that belief implies more than just a head knowledge. And I know that many of you uh, come from a place where you've had some church exposure. Most, most of us have been in uh, the Midwest 
blessed by that. Some have not. But sometimes it's harder to untwist the church exposure that we have had than it is to just come to Christ with uh, almost no knowledge of him. And so on one side, if you take extremes, if, if you think about ortho, Orthodox Christianity, you have this idea that I, I believe, but it's all because I believe, then it's all based upon my belief and my work. So if I'm doing good, my belief is valid. <laughs> Right? And so if I'm doing good on Sunday, I'm probably in. If I'm doing bad on Monday, eh, I'm probably not in. And that's a really, really hard way to live. It, it, guilt, it's shame, it's works-driven, and uh, it's me-centered. On the other side of things, there are Orthodox groups who say, as long as you believe, it doesn't matter what you do, man. If you confessed it and you believe it, then you're in. And so, you know... Uh, Little Susie, she confesses Jesus when she's in the second grade at church camp. And then little Susie lives like hell the rest of her life. She doesn't want anything to do with the church. You don't have to go to church to be a Christian, which, which is true. I mean, kind of, except that Jesus said one of the main indicators of you uh, being one of his is you'll love to be around his, his disciples. But let's throw that out for a second. Technically, I guess you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Little Susie doesn't do anything that pertains to God her whole life, except maybe, you know, she takes off her cap at the races and uh, when we pray and, uh, and then, uh, you know, thanks God for the, the Bud Light. Well, she's not drinking that now because of what just happened a couple weeks ago. <laughs> Coors Light, you know. Um, but, but the reality is um, that's, that's a lot how it goes. And then she gets... She, she dies, and somebody in that camp says, little Susie believed when she was in the second grade, so Jesus has welcomed her in. And the reality is that's, that's just as harmful and not biblical as little Susie had to do it day in and day out on her own. I believe, so then I do good, so then I please God. And, and the reality is belief works like this. The demons actually believe, but they tremble. And so when's the last time you trembled at God? You might say, probably it's been a while. And so to the good, they tremble because they're scared of the God they know, but they know in their head, and yet they don't have belief that saves. And many people walk around with a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. So belief is not just, I, I believe that Jesus died for me and rose again. It's, it's a life change. Actions imply a belief. So that's why James writes, that if you have faith, it'll have works. We're not working for our faith. We're working from our faith. And it doesn't make us saved. It proves to us what we are and to others. So that said, he who believes in Jesus, who has this belief, this relational belief, though he may die, he says, uh, he shall live. Now he goes on to say, and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. So God promises this relational, uh, 1 John, it's a walk with Christ. That's, that's what knowing God or believing in God is. It's a walk. It's my spirit knows because his spirit lives within me that I'm, that I'm his, even when I'm not getting it right. Uh, my spirit knows as it walks with his when I'm off the track. My spirit hears his voice and and then knows him. That's the idea. And for those who have that kind of belief, then we shall never die. Now, here's the thing. Humanity, according to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 15, generally lives fearing death and enslaved by sin and death. And I said this first service, and I believe this. You know that there are outliers. There are people that don't seem to think about death, and they don't fear death, and they are crazy as pet coons. You've never, you've never, like, you, those people are dangerous. If you've ever been around people who don't fear death at all, they are dangerous. You, you don't want to be with them in a foxhole. You don't want to be with them in an IROC Camaro. You don't want to be with them. And they probably do drive an IROC, or they used to. Now, the, the point is that intrinsically, because we're broken and we know we stand accountable, people fear death. And so God comes with Jesus Christ and he gives the Christian the opportunity to only fear dying. Because the fear of death and sin is knowing that I, 
Death has implications eternally. My sin has implications eternally. But then when that's paid for, the Christian, and I have had the opportunity to see people that apparently feared not even dying, very few. I don't think there's any shame in fearing dying because dying's hard. One of the most honorable and wonderful and horrible things I get to do as a pastor is watch people die at their bedsides or in car wrecks or wherever I get called to. And it, it is rarely easy. It is hard. It stings is what the Bible says. And so the Christian doesn't have to fear the penalty of death or the consequences of death, but the process can still sting and yet 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 56 says that the sting of death is sin, but thanks be to God who has given us victory through Jesus Christ. And 1 Corinthians 6, 14 is the one I have for you here. God has raised the Lord and will raise us through his power. And so all we have to fear, if you're going to fear anything, is the process, not the penalty. And this is the hope and the joy. And so... The last phrase in this section is, do you believe this? Do you believe this? And when Jesus is asking Martha this, he's asking, have you based your life upon this? Is this what you're building your life upon? See, most of us in our culture stay so busy, we don't even contemplate this. Let's just do more because doing to us is being. But to have eternal life, then you do out of your being. And yet, do you believe this? Because it's been paid in full. And so finally, by his grace, God provides salvation to all who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ through his blood, his death, his burial, his resurrection. It's all for our sins. And the cross is the payment and as we often tell you, the resurrection is the receipt. It's the proof that for any who believe, it's paid in full. And when Jesus hung on that cross, many of you know, he spoke a word we wouldn't use to tell us die. It's his last word that he spoke as he hung on the cross. His, his kind of final statement, not his very last word, but his final statement is... Um, to telestai, which is translated, uh, it is finished and or paid in full. And all that remains is for us to believe. Father God, we just thank you. And we praise you for resurrection and life. We thank you for the opportunity to get to celebrate that today, just watching someone be dunked down in the water, the old person put away, and the new person raised uh, to life eternal. So we pray for those who are here. Do a work in their life this Easter to help us uh, believe and then act on our belief. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can stand. After this song, I will see you out at the baptismal beach.